Hello there. Today we're going to be talking about one of the hottest topics in biotechnology and probably in the world right now, gene editing and genomic engineering. And the star of the video will be no other than the gene editing system that has been the talk of town for the past few years, CRISPR-Cas9. I remember one of my first days in uni, in my first semester, and one of the professors said, I will introduce you to a word that you will hear for the rest of your lives. And he wrote down the word CRISPR, and man, was he right. We heard about CRISPR for the whole bachelors, and then again in the masters, and now even at work we're doing CRISPR-related stuff. So if you're remotely involved or interested in the biotech field, chances are you will hear or work with CRISPR a lot. That's why I got a little bit overexcited when last year Jennifer Doutna and Emmanuel Charpentier got the Nobel Prize for discovering the applications and the potential of CRISPR-Cas. And it was the first women-only prize in history, by the way. So we're talking about a technique that can, I kid you not, change the history of humankind forever, as it allows us the possibility to edit the genome in a way that no other technique had done so before. So far, there are ongoing clinical trials using CRISPR-Cas for enhancing the immune system against cancer, as well to treat HIV, blindness, and many other conditions. But what is really breathtaking is the potential it has. Some genetic diseases, such as Huntington's and cystic fibrosis, may one day be history. In addition to being able to reverse or even end aging and even custom designing our offspring. Yes, designing babies. This is the first of many videos of the CRISPR series. In the next videos, we will be talking more in depth about some of the applications that I just mentioned and the bioethical debates surrounding this topic. Bang Sang, one of the pioneers of CRISPR, compares this tool to a cursor. It is so much easier to edit a text when you can point at exactly what you want to edit, as that helps you delete a word or add a word. In genetics, these deletions or additions are referred to as knock outs and knock-ins. These modifications in the genome open up a whole world of possibilities, starting with being a great tool for research. By eliminating or adding genes to an organism, we can study the role of particular genes in obesity or cancer, for example. We could also alter the sex-determining gene in malaria mosquitoes so that the male gene is more dominant over the female one, eventually leading to eradication. In agriculture, it can be used to improve disease resistance and herbicide tolerance. The applications are endless. And not only that, but when it comes to gene editing, it's a game changer. It's fast, way cheaper, the yield is so much higher, and it's way more simple. So simple that it has started this movement of the so-called biohackers. Have you watched the documentary on natural selection? Because if you haven't, you should. In this documentary, you can see people that are crispering, yes, people use it as a verb now, at the comfort of their homes. And you don't even have to be an expert. I'm sure in the very near future, people will just be able to buy CRISPR kits on Amazon. Okay, amazing, but where does this CRISPR thing even come from? Where has it been this whole time? Contrary as what it may seem, this isn't something that us, almighty humans have created. Do you know where CRISPR was originally discovered? In bacteria. That's right, those little unicellular organisms could figure out a way of hacking the genome. Meanwhile, we're here, we're thinking we're so cool because we went to the moon or whatever. CRISPR is actually a fancy immune system found in bacteria. Wait, what? Bacteria have an immune system? They're the ones attacking us? Yet they have an immune system? I'm telling you, bacteria are smarter than we think. I'm kidding, it's evolution. Bacteria don't actually think. I got asked that once. There is a type of virus called bacteriophages. As you may have guessed, they attack bacteria. For this reason, evolution has led some bacteria to acquire a defense mechanism against this type of virus. They take a part of this viral genome and they keep it in their own DNA in case they get attacked by the same virus in the future, so they can easily recognize it. And if they do get attacked, they identify this viral genome and they cut it, they degrade it. But the revolution came when it was discovered that this system that can find a particular sequence in the genome and cut it would work in any type of cell, not just in bacteria. And this discovery is what eventually led to the Nobel Prize. And how does this lead to a baby designing tool? Well, essentially, what the system does is that it can go to a specific place in the genome, sort of like a GPS, and cut the sequence that you wanted to cut, and even allows you the possibility to replace this gene with another gene. There was actually a bit of tea in this part of the story. <laughs> Yes, 
yes, these two ladies discovered the applications of CRISPR, a system which was previously discovered by the Spanish researcher Francis Mojica, who was sadly not part of the Nobel Prize, but they discovered the applications in prokaryotic cells, so essentially bacteria and archaea. And as you can imagine, with such a revolutionary breakthrough, everybody rushed and did as many experiments as they could to be part of this event, right? Feng Sang of the Broad Institute at MIT used CRISPR in eukaryotic cells at the same time Doudna was doing so, but he was the first one to publish the results. And this is essential when it comes to patents. So this is when the tea started. Yes, Down and Charpentier were the first ones to discover the applications, but Sang was the first one to use it in eukaryotic cells. And if we're talking about applications in humans, in animal cells, in plants, that's what actually matters. So whoever got the patent was gonna get a lot of money from the tons of application CRISPR has. I like money. What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? Money. The dispute went for years, but long story short, Feng Sang won the legal battle as he was indeed the first one to publish the results. So he got the patent and the ladies got the Nobel Prize. I guess it's fair, but I think I'm kind of biased anyways because I've been teamed out now all along. Okay, so enough gossiping, back to science. Why is CRISPR so powerful? What makes it so special? Gene editing does not start with CRISPR. There are other techniques such as zinc finger nucleases and talon, or talon, that are already allowed to perform some changes in the genome. But they were complicated, expensive, and took forever to do. And the actual success rate was very low. CRISPR, on the other hand, allows a much more precise gene editing for a fraction of the cost and in a matter of hours. You can think of it as molecular scissors. But let me introduce you to its two key parts. Cas9, an enzyme that binds to the sequence and cuts it, and the guide RNA, like a little policeman that goes through the DNA searching for a specific sequence and recognizes it. And precisely this guide RNA is one of the things that makes it so powerful because it is customizable. It can be designed to mirror the sequence that you want to edit, what we call the target sequence. So just picture it this way. This complex will use the guide RNA to travel through the DNA until it finds a sequence to which it matches, aka the target sequence, the gut RNA and the DNA then bind, the Cas9 enzyme is then activated and boom, it cuts the DNA. So now I have another question for you. If the original goal, the evolutionary goal of CRISPR is to inactivate foreign viral genome, how come we use it to treat diseases? In a bacterium, if a viral DNA or RNA is cut, that's it, bye-bye genome. Nobody's gonna run and repair it. But that's not the case in the genome in our own cells. Cells have something we call repair mechanisms. It's a pretty self-explanatory name, so I guess you can imagine what they do. When these repair mechanisms detect a break in the DNA, they freak out and run to help. However, this is an error-prone process, and yes, it can successfully repair the DNA, but it can also introduce mutations during this process. And precisely this is advantageous when we're trying to create the knockouts that we were talking about earlier, aka inactivating a gene. But the CRISPR technology has advanced to a point that we can now not only design it to cut a sequence, but also to introduce the correct sequence or a modified sequence. This means that we could potentially eliminate a disease-causing mutation in a gene and replace it with a functional gene. It sounds easier than it actually is, but it is indeed a possibility. In fact, CRISPR doesn't only allow you to introduce the correct form of this gene, but also something entirely random. I mean, an entirely random gene. Like a green fluorescent protein that can make fish fluorescent, for example, or rats, for that matter, without the animals even noticing. This whole green fluorescent protein might sound very sci-fi to you, but you'd be interested to know that this is actually a very common practice in labs. In fact, it's so common that we normally use it as a control to make sure that the genetic engineering worked. Okay, so you may be thinking, wow, this CRISPR thing sounds amazing. It sounds like it's gonna save the world. Is it all good news? Well, the answer is no. Although it is an unarguably powerful tool, not everything's perfect. First of all, let's not forget about the fact that the whole CRISPR boom started in 2012, so not even 10 years ago. There are so many things that we still don't know and that we still don't understand, especially when it comes to therapies and introducing things in the human body, we need to be extra careful. Even more so if we're dealing with something that can straight up change our genome. 
For this reason, scientists are trying to understand what the side effects of CRISPR might be. Just remember that your entire information as a human being is written in your genes. I always try to put it the same way. You come from just one cell, which is the result of the fusion between the sperm cell and the egg, the ovary. And from that single cell, you happened. Everything that is in your body was produced and formed thanks to this information that is in your genes. So you can't imagine how long the DNA is. The human genome contains approximately 3 billion base pairs. So there is not a huge but yet existing chance that this guide RNA that is only approximately 20 nucleotides long matches more than one sequence in the genome meaning that the CRISPR complex can maybe bind to another sequence that is not the target sequence and cut it as well. It has been observed that CRISPR can introduce breaks that then lead to deletions and rearrangements that were not originally aimed for. Of course, these off-targets can be inoffensive, but what if they're not? For example, a current concern is that it can end up altering genes that can either enhance or protect from cancer. So this is definitely something that needs to be more studied and that we should keep in mind. But this at the same time raises another debate. If CRISPR can treat a person with a chronic disease, but at the same time increase the chances of this person getting cancer, is it still worth it? Obviously, this depends on how high the risk is, but in any case, there is still much to be yet discovered and understood. And another huge problem is the moral debate surrounding the whole CRISPR topic. Many say things like eradicating malaria mosquitoes and making an embryo resistant to a disease is a little bit like playing God. Which is why the laws on CRISPR are currently very, very strict. If genes in an embryo are altered, even if it's for a good case, the vast majority of the cells coming from this embryo will have the addition, including sperm cells and ovaries, which means they will be able to pass it down to the offspring. And not only that, but what can start as an intention to treat diseases and improve the quality of life can become a tool for the elite to create superhumans with specific traits that would make them automatically better than the rest. And this is what is commonly referred to as slippery slope. This on its own is already such a complex topic, therefore I will make a video exclusively on the bioethics of CRISPR, the signer babies, so stay tuned if you're interested. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Let me know down below in the comments what you think about this topic, if you have any ideas for the series that are coming next, and see you in the next video. Bye!